Okay, here we are at video three. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something that's very foundationally important for what we're going to be doing with calculus over the next few months. Um, and so you're going to want to make sure that you have good grasp. If you need to watch this video a couple of times or pause and come back, please do that. Um, but the general idea to get us started today is we're going to be looking at extrema of functions. And hopefully extrema sounds familiar. Extrema means the max or mins of functions, and those can be local um, or those can be absolute, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. And to find those, you're going to be looking for things called critical numbers. So that's going to be something else we're, we'll talk about. But first, let's look at kind of what happens graphically um, when we're looking for extrema. So I have a graph here. This could be maybe negative x cubed. Um, this is my function. And I'm going to look, obviously you can see I have some little local max and mins here, but I'm going to look at the slope of my graph. So I'm going to look at the derivative um, and just kind of start talking about what I notice. So if you'll notice first, if I'm drawing, if I'm looking for the slope of the tan line, you'll notice that that slope is a decreasing line or it's a negative value. And I'm getting, I'm letting that point kind of get closer and closer to this lowest value. And then you'll notice that when I'm right on that lowest value, my slope or my derivative is perfectly zero, perfectly horizontal. And then on the other side, I start to have a positive slope, meaning I have a slope that is a positive value. And even though it kind of starts to get less positive, it stays positive right until that highest point. And again, you have a slope of your tan line being zero. And then, once again, my slope starts to be downward facing, and so I have that side. Now, something else you might notice while we're here is that in this section, when my slope was de was my slope was negative, I had a decreasing part of my graph. When my slope was something that was positive, I had an increasing portion to my graph. And then again, you'll notice here I'm decreasing again in the graph, and I have a negative slope. So we'll talk about that later, but that's something just to kind of take a look at. So again, negative slope was a decreasing graph. Positive slope of my tangent line was increasing. So <clears throat> you can see that we have maxes or mins at these potential maxes and mins at these places where my slope is zero, where I've flattened out. Um, so let's take a look at another graph because there is another circumstance to kind of pay attention to and that is what if my graph doesn't keep going on forever and ever like this one did so in this graph over here i definitely have places where my slope is zero right and so i have potential little maxes and mins but if i asked you for the absolute max or the absolute min you'd want to see if there's any places you don't go lower well when your graph has a specific starting and stopping point then there absolutely may be an absolute max or min in fact my absolute lowest does occur right here. And my absolute max, well, let's see, here are my two maxes. So you might think, oh, this is my absolute max. Well, because this is an interval, I have to also check the value of the ends because perhaps the end is the max or the min. So something to keep in mind, if your graph continues forever, you're more than likely going to be looking at local maxes, mins, although not always. Um, but if your graph does start and stop, then you have to consider the endpoints as possible maxes and mins as well. So looking at this a uh, little bit more mathy, if you will, um, if I'm looking for these places that might be potential maxes or mins, I'm looking for places where my slope is zero. So we call these potential maxes or mins critical numbers. And one of the places we're going to look for is when our slope or the derivative is zero. But check out this graph. We also have a minimum here and a minimum here. And those are not when my slope is zero. Those are sharp turns in the graph. So sharp turns can also create maxes or mins. And if you remember, that's when the derivative didn't exist. So not only do we have to look for when it's zero, but we also might have a potential max or min when the when the derivative doesn't exist. Um, most of that time, that's when the derivative um, ends up with a zero in the denominator, or there's a way to make a zero of the denominator. So let's take a look at this graph here. Um, clearly, you can see I've got a little max here, 
got my horizontal tangent line. I've got a min down here. Notice this one was an increasing and then decreasing, so I had a maximum. Here I was decreasing, but then flipped to increasing and became a minimum. And then there's actually one other place where my derivative has a slope value that's zero. My graph has a slope of zero, or the derivative is zero. But look at that, that doesn't make a max or min. Now let's look at why. We went from decreasing to, oh, still decreasing. When you don't change from being like increasing to decreasing, you're not changing, um, you're not creating a max or a min. So that's why this little guy down here, this one in the middle, was not a max or min. So just because you're a critical number doesn't mean that you're going to be a max or a min. It just means you have the potential to be a max or a min. So just a couple guidelines. First, you'd want to find the critical numbers. You want to see what the value is at those critical numbers, check the endpoints, and then decide what your max and mins are. So let's look at that in, in um, actual process. <clears throat> so I want to find the maxes and mins on this closed interval. So I actually do my endpoints of my intervals first, because remember, those endpoints could be your max and min. So let's plug in negative 3 to our value. So if I plug in negative 3 into this, let's see, I get negative 27 plus 36, which ends up giving me positive 9. When I plug in 5, 5 cubed is 125 minus 60, giving me 65. All right, but we could have critical values that create maxes or mins along the way. How do we find those? set the derivative equal to 0. So first we have to find it. This derivative is pretty easy. 3x squared minus 12. So I look for whenever the derivative is 0 or technically undefined, but this is a polynomial, so it's never going to be undefined. Um, I'm going to factor this. I'm going to solve this by factoring because we're going to use that technique quite a bit. So here I go, continuing to factor. Set each part of the product equal to 0. This part is never going to be 0, so I don't have to worry about the 3. Uh, this part would end up being 0 when x is 2, and this would be 0 when x is negative 2. So these are my critical numbers. So I'm going to add them to my list of potential possible max or mins. So that means I also have to check negative 2, and I also have to check 2. So I'm going to plug in negative 2 to my original. That's negative 8 plus 24, which is 16. And if I plug in 2, I get 8 minus 24, or negative 16. So let's see what we've got here. So my minimum value would be my lowest value. So I have a, let's see, on this interval, I have an absolute minimum at x equals 2. Now the actual minimum itself is negative 16, but it happens at x equals 2. All right, my max on this interval is 65. So I have an absolute maximum at x equals 5. Again, the maximum itself is 65, but it happens at x equals 5. Okay, let's try another one. So in the second example, we're doing the exact same thing, but we're finding it from 0 to 9. So first I need to test the values of f of 0 and f of 9. So when I plug in 0, I get negative 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. You should know how to do this. Um, to the 2 thirds is really just the cube root first and then squaring. So the cube root of negative 1 is still negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1 plus 2 is 3. Plug in 9. 9 gives me 8 to the 2 thirds plus 2. Uh, let's see. Cube root of 8 is 2. 2 squared is 4 plus 2 is 6. So we've got our endpoints. Now we have to see if there are any critical numbers along the way. So let's start with the derivative. Here, I've got to do chain rule, so I've got 2 thirds times my quantity, take it down by a power. Inside derivative is 1, so that's easy, and then the derivative of 2 is 0, so I'm done. So I want to set this equal to 0. Now, before you go doing anything, setting this to 0, looking for undefines, if you have a negative exponent, you really should rewrite that as a positive exponent in the appropriate place. It'll help you to see your zeros and your undefines more clearly. So again, I'm going to be looking for when this is 0 and undefined. Let's start with 0. Uh, 0 is only when the numerator is 0 uh, for a fraction. So the only time that could be 0 is if I can make the top 0, and unfortunately I can't. There's no x up there, so there are no zeros. Let's to see if there's any places where it's undefined. That would be when the denominator is 0. Divide both sides by 3. I'm going to raise both sides to the third power to cancel out the one-third. So I get x minus 1 equals 0, or x is 1 is my only critical number. 
So I'm going to add f of 1 to my list. 1 minus 1 is 0 to the 2 thirds, which just gives me 2. So max and min values, let's take a look. We have an absolute minimum at x equals 1. The minimum itself is 2. And we have an absolute max at x equals 9. And again, the actual absolute max is 6. So if I ask you for the max and min values, the actual max value is 6, the actual min value is 2, this is the x values that it happens at. All right, in our third example, we want just the absolute max. We want it on this closed interval, and we want it at what x value. So first things first, let's test our endpoints. So we've got negative 2 cubed, which is negative 8. We've got negative 2 squared times negative 3 ends up being negative 12 plus 12, negative 8. We've got 4, so we've got 64. We've got minus 48 plus 12, which I believe ends up being, let's see, 76 minus 48 gives us 38? No, 28. Okay. All right, so now we need to see if we have any critical numbers. So I need the derivative. Good news, the derivative here is not that bad. The derivative is 3x squared minus 6x. So we need to set this guy equal to 0. Again, I'm going to factor out what I can. I can factor 3x. I get x minus 2. Here I do have a way of making this part 0 at when x is 0, and this would be 0 when x is 2. Again, I'm really just setting each of those equal to 0, but they're pretty easy, so I can do them in my head. So I need f of 0 and f of 2. Notice I like to keep them in order. Um, that's your choice, but I like to do that. f of 0 is pretty easy, 0, 0, 12. And f of 2, that gives me an 8, minus 12, plus 12, which ends up being a positive 8. Okay, so um, let's find our absolute max. So our absolute max will be where we have the biggest value, which is at this value that gives us 28, and that ends up being at x equals 4. So you need to say you have an absolute max happening at, they want the x value, x equals 4. All right, we have one last little one to look at, and that involves the calculator. So let's, t let's take a look at this. I even reminded you you could use your calculator here. So the first derivative of f is given, and so they've given you that function. This is the derivative. They want to know the values at which x has a critical number from 0 to pi. Well, you should know to get a critical number, the derivative needs to be 0. So I'm looking for when this function is 0. So here is a graph of that. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that on your graphing calculator. You can go ahead and plug in sine of x squared. Make sure that you are in radian mode, which I am here, and then you can graph that. Now, this graph is just a trip typical trig graph, but we only want it from 0 to pi. So if I go to window and change my x values to go from 0, enter, to pi, then I can see just specifically what I want to see. And so there, you're going to notice mine isn't quite, I have a taller window than I do over here, um, but it's the same thing. So I'm looking for these values. I'm looking for this value right here when it's 0, this value of 0, this value of 0, and that value of 0. Now to me, this looks like there's a 0 here. You could always look at the table and see, yes, there is a 0 at 0. So that's kind of my first one. And then I can also see that there's going to be zeros anywhere it goes from being like a positive to a negative. So somewhere in between 1 and 2, it looks like it also goes from being positive to negative here between 3 and 4. It's also negative to positive between 2 and 3. So I've got a lot. So then the last little piece is how do you find zeros on your calculator? Second trace or calc. They're not trying to trick you. It's 0. And then you just need to make sure you're somewhere, like I'm going to find that zero. So I'm going to be somewhere before it, to the left of it. I'm going to hit enter. I move my little cursor past the zero, somewhere to the right of it. These little arrows tell me where it's going to look. I hit guess, yep, enter. And it should give me the x value, 1.772. Now this little e to the negative 13th just means 10 to the negative 13th, which is zero. So I'm going to round my answer to three decimal places. 
you can find these other values uh, doing the zero function uh, again. So I listed my four critical values. Good luck on the problem sets and uh, see me in class if you need extra help.